think if everyone is ready, we'll plan to get started with this month's webinar. Um, I'd like to say hello to all the listeners out there. My name is Abby Bauer, and I'm an associate editor for Horde Steerman Magazine, and I'd like to take the time now to welcome you to today's webinar, which is brought to you by Horde Steerman and the University of Illinois. It takes us a team to produce the webinars, and I want to give a, a pat of appreciation to our behind-the-scenes crew of Jim Baltz, who is with the University of Illinois, and Patty Hurchin, who is our Horde Steerman online media manager, who do a lot of the work before beforehand to make sure these webinars run smoothly each and every month. My co-host for today is the well-known and respected Mike Hutchins, who comes to us from the University of Illinois. And together, we have the pleasure of welcoming a pair of speakers for this webinar. And I think um, all of our audience members will be in for a real treat today, as we have a dairy farmer and veterinarian duo presenting for us. Um, Brian Schilling, he is a dairy farmer from Wisconsin is joining us along with his farm's veterinarian, Dr. B.J. Jones, from Center Hill Vet Clinic in southwestern Wisconsin. Their presentation, which is titled, This Award-Winning Herd Talks About Reproductive Strategies, and they will cover some of the reproductive programs and protocols that they're using on Schilling Farms LLC, um, Brian's Family Dairy, which has been recognized six times by the Dairy Cattle Reproduction Council as one of its annual reproduction award winners. So no other farm has won that award more times, and we are just very pleased to have Brian and Dr. Jones on board with us today. Mike, um, if you could just give a little more of an introduction of our speakers and then kick off this webinar, I think we are ready to go. Well, very good, Abby. It's my uh, pr professional honor to introduce our, our doubleheader. We have a doubleheader today with baseball season starting now in, uh, as well. Uh, today, uh, Brian Schilling is a partner in the Schilling Farms at uh, Darlington, Wisconsin, since 2003. Uh, Brian is the primary herdsman for the farm and is responsible for the breeding program, which, of course, is our focus for today's program. He, along with his brother Andy, was recognized in 2017 as the commercial dairy Farm Manager of the Year by the National Dairy Shrine. And of course, as Abby indicates, they've won multiple recognitions from the Dairy Cattle Reproductive Council. Uh, the other doubleheader here today is Dr. B.J. Jones, a veterinarian at uh, Center Hill Veterinary Clinic, and he's been a practicing veterinarian since 1997 with a special focus on dairy cattle reproduction. He earned his DVM uh, degree from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as a master's degree in dairy cattle breeding genetics from the University of Minnesota. He's also a past board member of the Dairy Cattle Reproductive Council. So without any further ado, gentlemen, we'll turn the program over to you and have you uh, bring us up to speed on your topic for the day. All right. All right. Thank you, Mike. This is Brian here. And uh, BJ Jones here. Uh, this here is just a quick little aerial photo of our dairy in Darlington, Wisconsin. It's just a little bit of delay on our end on the slides. So this is a uh, this is a family picture of my parents, Bill and Barb, and my brother Andy and his four children and wife, and then me and my four children and my wife here. Um, farms located in southwestern Wisconsin. Uh, the, biz uh, the business is primarily uh, dairy um, for diver and with some diversified crop income. Uh, we've been in operation for 47 years and it started by my grandfather and then been passed down through the generations. Uh, currently, we're milking around 600 cows, farming uh, 1,900 acres, 1,100 which we own, and 800 additional acres rented, and chopping about 500 acres of alfalfa. And then we have also 800 acres of corn we run and harvest, typically, 10,000 tons of corn silage for forage and then the rest for grain and some sales. Also running some small acreages of winter wheat and barley for cover crops for 
after corn silage and to practice good stewardship of the land and that. Uh, um, mow quality is we take pride in. Um, cows average about 101 pounds, 3x milking. The rolling herd average 32,000, 4% butter fat, and about a 3,3 uh, protein cell count with a 45,000. Uh, the dairy cows are housed in two separate freestyle barns, uh, natural ventilated, sand stalls, uh, six row barns, and we try to stock to 100% um, by the stalls. Uh, milking's done in a uh, double 12 herringbone parlor. Nothing pretty, but it gets the job done for us. Okay, well, we have our first um, uh, uh, polling question, so get ready to vote here. Uh, we're just kind of curious what people are doing out there but in your countries, in your counties, in your, in, in your states. What percent of your, of your cow herd, now remember this is cow herd, cow herd is being bred to beef semen. Not your heifer herd, your cow herd. So we have five choices here, and the polls are now open, and we're off and running. Zero, a one to twenty-five percent, uh, twenty-six to fifty percent, fifty-one to seventy-five percent, and over seventy-five percent. So, um, Abby, are you are is hordes using any beef semen? Do you know out at their farm? Um, not not a lot at this point. So, okay, um, it's definitely a trend that's out there. Um, you know, I'm seeing it more and more as you talk to people. And I think just making sure you're using the right beef semen is kind of the key. You know, not just, can't just be a black calf, but make sure you're producing the right kind of animal. I think that's what people are learning as we keep moving forward. Yeah, and I guess, Abby, we're seeing some trends, also some some associations so that they can get those calves sold at the right price rather than just go to the sale barn. Well, Jim, we're a minute in, so let's go ahead and uh, close the poll. We got 60% of our participants voting here. And uh, gentlemen, what do you think of the results here? And uh, Brian, uh, what is your number on your farm? Uh, at our farm, we're using about 25% bee semen right, or right now, but we are thinking about changing that up, possibly going closer to that 50% and a little more sex semen. Uh, we've been playing around with it a little bit. Um, the results, I'm probably kind of what I expected to see a little bit. Yeah, I think uh, part of the reason we put this question in, this is BJ, um, I just know it's a hot topic really right now in the breeding industry with everyone having such an excess of dairy heifers, at least in our area. And um, we've had a lot of herds that were at that zero mark uh, a year, year and a half ago that, you know, are now probably in that one to 25%. And then we have some too in that 51 to 75%. So um, I, you know, it's certainly a trend in the industry and, and trying to target how many heifers you're producing and how many beef animals you're producing is going to be key, I think, to future success. So Okay, so uh, we're, next we're gonna get into the, the breeding data. Um, so basically, as I said, we've been recognized uh, as some of the, one of the better pregnancy rate, better breeding herds in the United States. And uh, right now, um, I think when we started winning that award, our pregnancy rates were more on that 30% rate. And we've just seen it continuing to go up from year to year. Right now we're at a 40% pregnancy rate uh, with a heat detection rate of around 73% and a conception rate. And this is on the cow herd of 56%. And we broke it down a little bit for you just to get an idea. Um, we're using getting a 59% on conventional Holstein semen. Uh, we have been using a little bit of sexed female semen in our, was it just the two-year-olds, Brian? Yeah. You know, and we're, we've kind of been going away from that, actually, just because we have an excess number of heifers as well. Um, but you can see the conception rate on that was just a little bit less at 45%. And then on the beef semen that we are using, we're seeing about the same as our Holstein semen at 59%. 
Uh, just wanted to show you this. This is a conception rate by week. And if you follow this yellow line, I, I kind of call it our average conception. Uh, over here on the right side is our most recent data from this past December. Um, so from this 24 January to here is from 2018. And then you can also go back and look at 2017. Um, but this blue line is basically our average conception rate of around 55%. And you can see how consistent, I think one interesting thing is this herd, how consistent they are on reproduction. And we actually did probably better two years ago than most recently. Um, but I think we do such a good job with our cow cooling and stuff. You don't see a summer slump. Um, a lot of our herds still see, you know, we'll see some depression in July and August around here is when we get to be really hot, um, more humidity. But we'll get in southwest Wisconsin, I mean, we can see 80s to 90s uh, with high humidity. Um, but I, I think just that's one thing that this herd has done really good at is maintaining. We're getting cows bred no matter what the conditions. Um, and then just go a little bit in our reproductive number in our heifers. Actually, our pregnancy rate in our heifers is 38%, so a little bit lower than the cows. Um, some of the reason for that is we aren't as aggressive in the heifers as our cows. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later on, you know, what we're using to get animals pregnant as far as synchronization and what types of heat detection uh, methods. Uh, but about 56% conception rate in the heifers. And we do use a lot of sex semen, uh, almost exclusively the first two services are bred to sexed female Holstein semen. So 85% of the breedings are that. That's the 52% conception rate. Um, we do have a little conventional semen if they don't get bred on those first two services uh 64 percent conception on that so they're doing a really good job of those heifers getting pregnant um we do like the sex female semen on our heifers those calves come out a lot smaller and those two-year-olds uh you, you see a lot less metritis and, and problems after calving um, and we're trying to target our best genetics there as well Um, next, we're going to move on to the heifers. I think, uh, Brian, you're going to yeah. take this section. So all the heifers are, are raised on the farm. Um, they're ray, uh, the wet calves are all raised in, in hutches, and they're fed pasteurized milk. They're weaned roughly at uh, about 54 days. And then from there, they go into our grower barn until about six months of age. They're on a couple different rations in that barn. And then once they are moved out of there, we have two other lots that they go into until breeding age. Now, this is just a picture of the grower barn there. Um, let's see. The the breeding age heifers once they each, uh, reach breeding age which we shoot for 12 to 13 months of age that they go in there um they are all housed outside and an open lot and headlocks and then we check them or they're in that group until 60 days pregnant or confirmed 60 days pregnant and then move to uh, a pregnant pen of heifers and they're all outside until about 200 days carried calf and then they come back to the dairy with the dry cow lot for trimming purposes um and then 21 days before calving the heifers are mixed or while well, they're already mixed with the ca mature cows but this is just a picture of them and the outside headlocks just a couple weeks ago. And then uh, we're we'll on to the fresh cows. Uh, the fresh or the the pre-fresh. Oh, did I skip it? No, you're good. Oh. The pre-fresh cows are housed in one, in the milking barn in the one pen for uh, 21 days. And there's two straw pack calving pens in there and we walk that pen's walked probably every half hour 45 minutes being there's more traffic where that area's at and then they're moved into the calving pen 
um, once we see feet or we notice they're starting to calve, uh, they are on a low energy straw diet. And then our post fresh, they are in there for 24 to 30, 30 days. And they are also, um, they are mixed, or they're, that's a group of all first and lactation and are all lactations are together in our post fresh. Did I skip one? Yeah. Um, the fresh fresh cow program, uh, second lactation cows, once they've calved in, uh, they are all, um, all their stomachs are pumped with a custom fresh cow drench we have made by our uh, feed our feed company for us um, and then there's alfalfa meal and a probiotic and they also receive an enforce their daily temp checked roughly about 20 days in that pen that they're temp checked and then we also check their BHBAs at day five and 11 and treated accordingly if they need to off of that. And at day 21, we shoot for vac vaccinating them with Bovashield and their J5, which it's their third dose of J5 at that point. And they are given a prostaglandin shot also at that time. And depending on the amount of animals in there, they're moved out 24 to 30 days. At, we only we try to stock at about 80 percent. This is just a picture of the cows once they've been temp checked. A green mark is for if their temperature is good, and yellow is a mild temp. And then I don't have a picture there, but pink is if they have a temp. Uh, and we're going to talk about our off sync program here next. So uh, this is BJ. So we don't actually do, uh, we just do a regular off sync and what would probably be called an off sync 48. Um, Brian did mention they get uh, a shot of prostaglandin or lutealize um, when you're given that fresh cow vaccination around three weeks post fresh. Um, but we aren't on a pre sync or a double off sync. It's a pretty simple program here actually. Um, compared to some other herds that we have uh, on. It, it seems to work really well for us and we've been on it a long time. A um, couple of the differences are, um, we laid it out kind of what days and they get what shots, but they get the GNRH or the, we use Sisterel on it. And Brian actually gives a heavier dose of GNRH on that Tuesday for that first G, G1, we call it. Um, seven days later, early in the morning, they get a prostaglandin or lutealis. Uh, 4 a.m. and then we do have been doing for quite a few years now. Uh, we'll talk about a little bit later a, a double loot or a, a second prostaglandin on Wednesday morning and then these cows are actually bred. Uh, they get their GNRH 48 hours after the first loot and that's a 3cc sister Ellen a little heavier dose again um, in that morning and then they're bred at 2 o'clock later that day um, and our goal is kind of the voluntary waiting period uh, is 86 to 93 days. Our goal is to average 90 days. Uh, so to do that, our first GNRH is 77 to 82 days. We try not to cherry pick um, heats before that, but there's about 15% of the cows that get bred uh, with natural heats after 75 days of milk. 85% um, of the cows are bred using this synchronization program for first service. And part of the reason we do that is uh, we're trying to give cows time to peak milk. Uh, we've been increasing our voluntary waiting period. Um, we're trying to get them a chance to peak. And then we're, we're getting such good conception rates on the first service um, with the synchronization program that um, when you get over half your cows pregnant on the first service, um, that takes a lot of the guesswork out of the rest of the breeding, I think. Um, and I think on uh, why we've had so much success is 
that you the compliance to your program that you're doing um, I'm pretty much the only one that does the implementing of the fertility program um, besides my brother if I happen to be gone but I think that's a big key is to have somebody dedicated to that certain job so it's done in a timely fashion and it becomes routine um, I think also um, I like giving it with disposable syringes just because I know each cow is getting each the right dose and it's always used a new needle too also um, and that way you know the right cows are getting the right shot at eat at the right time and you can't miss it otherwise you won't have near the success also um, doing it weekly I think has really helped it's smaller groups and it's a routine becomes a routine and it also works in good being we do a weekly herd check too and uh, nutrition plays a huge role in it that makes sure your cows are in a great body condition that way they're cycling because if they're not cycling you won't see near the success especially with the second prostaglandin shot you'll see a higher rate of twinning if they're not cycling correctly so this is dr jones again this so a lot of you have probably seen slides like this, but this is the, our days in milk at the first insemination. And uh, we drew a line here, uh, or there's a line here, like at 80 days, if you see on the grid. Um, but this is over the last couple of years. These really, you see a straight line every, that's the offset groups every week. Um, and you can see a lot of the cows um, are bred in those offsets weekly. Uh, from time to time, though, like here, we must have been seeing a lot more natural heat. Um, but there's really no cows getting bred before 75 days in milk. And like we talked about, we're 86 to 93 days. So that'd be like from here to, to here is where most of the breedings occur. Um, and, and that's kind of what we strive for. There's a few cows here over 100 days, and those are probably ones that uh, what would you say, Brian? Just weren't ready to be bred yet, yeah. or maybe had some pro fresh cow problems. Oh, uh, also, if they have a higher cell count or a case of mastitis, I I won't breed them. There's plenty of data to see on that that the uh, conceptions on cows with mastitis or higher cell count don't seem to settle near as well. So I choose to wait till they're back in the main milking stream. So I think the one thing to take out of this, though, is just the consistency, I think, of, uh, you know, getting the cows bred by the right day. Unless, like I said, unless Brian thinks they got a problem with cell count or, or something like that. So um, some changes that we've made over the past year, few past 10 years. Um, originally, we were I think we were shooting to, uh, about 60 days of milk was the first service which I think is probably a pretty common number that I think you see in the industry. Um, we gradually had, um, increased it originally, I think, on our heifers because we weren't uh, seeing the peak milks that we wanted to. So the heifers were actually 10 days longer at that time when we first started and we seen some higher conception rates along with that. And then also we went uh, we changed after seeing the results from that with the uh, higher conception rates and the improved uh, milk peaks. We also moved the mature cows to 70 days. And then we kept kind of pushing it up to 10 days at a time. And currently, so we're shooting for 90 days right now. I'm actually thinking the first uh, april i'm gonna push it up to 100 days before 100 days in milk before first service to shoot for just to see if i can push it anymore or not um 
And then another, the other things we've changed is um, the GNRH doses. We've gone to four cc's on the G1 shot and the G2 uh, three cc's. Oh, and also that double prostaglandin shot we started at, I think, four years ago and seen pretty good success with that. Um, so the other thing I think that's atypical, at least from our practices, uh, if you listen to Dr. Fricky from the UW Madison or and all the people have been doing the gene or the the fertility program research with OffSync is they say OffSync 56, which is 56 hours between your 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 loot and your your GNRH, your first loot, is kind of the ideal timing and actually here just based on the, the labor schedule and the breeder schedule um we do more of what's called an off 48 and it we've just seen really good conception rates with it and, and this breeder has actually used a couple different herds and it's it's worked well for us um so i guess there's just more ways to skin the cat i get so to say and i think you know you need to do what I think with the great compliance and the things that they're doing, I mean, it's worked really well for them. Well, we'll give <clears throat> Dr. Jones and Brian a bit of a break here. And here's our second uh, uh, survey question for our today's webinar. And so the polls are open. Jim has got the polls open. What is your primary method of pregnancy detection? And it'll be interesting to see where, where Brian comes in on this one as well. The first choice is the blood test. Another one is rectal palpation. Uh, third choice is uh, rectal ultrasound. And uh, the fourth choice is some other one as far as that goes uh, here. That could be some of your, your painting of tails or chalking or, or something like that could fall in that category as, as well. So anyway, um, uh, we are got the polls open and we're off and running again. And, uh, and Abby, any, any thoughts on uh, where, where we're going to see the winners on this one? Um, no, the numbers will be interesting to see. I think at the Horde Steerman Farm, we work with one of our local vet clinics and do weekly ultrasound preg checks. I think that's a popular method, but depending where you live and your access to a vet clinic that can do that, um, the blood test has become a more popular option for maybe some of those farms that don't have access to a vet as often. So be curious to see what people are doing. Yeah, we're at uh, we got about sixty percent of the vote again. Uh, we got slow voting today. Must be the must be the nice weather we're having. Anyway, Jim, let's go ahead and close the poll, and we'll share it. And uh, Dr. Jones and Brian, you may want to comment on any surprises or or what what do you see here as far as uh, the attendees? I mean, I think it's kind of what we uh, would expect. Uh, I think ultrasound, at least in Southwest Wisconsin, has certainly kind of been um, in the last 20 years has really gained traction and um, is probably the most primary method as well. I, I know there's some other vets out there still doing rectal palpation. We do have a few herds too doing the blood test. We're fortunate we have a lot of uh, vets in the area, but I do have a few guys using it kind of as a confirmation test to dry off and uh, actually that you can do, it, and I should have included that, uh, is you can do it through our DHI Ag Source now as a milk test um, as well. But I think the immediacy of the ultrasound and the ability to tell if there's twins or the, the sex of the pregnancy is really uh, what we really like here at Shillings anyways, is what we've been using. So let's get back on the presentation and then that's actually uh, a visual of a 60-day pregnancy uh, in our goggles and we wear goggles we have uh, two main vets that do uh, pregnancy detection uh, and the goggles let us do it in daylight conditions and uh, out in the barns really easy um, how we run things at shillings um, we basically do two preg checks uh, with ultrasound and we target, um, you'll see some things where they want to give GNRH ahead of time. And um, we don't do that here. I mean, we've messed around with it in the past, but we're basically trying to, to check those cows at 32 days. It's a good time to preg check them. Um, if, if they aren't pregnant, they usually have a good CL or corpus luteum, 
which is a good time if you want to start a resync on an off sync. So um, our our second preg check, we'll do it 59 to 66 days. And that's basically when we're doing our twin detection. And we do try to do uh, in a timely manner fetal sexing as well. Brian likes to know for just as another bit of criteria in his cows, you know, for either calling or uh, I don't know what to use it for, Brian, the fetal sexing. Is it kind of all we got coming in for inventory wise? So and I think that's going to become more and more important too um, with guys as well, where we're trying to control the number of heifers we're producing. Um, and as I said, if they do have a CL, which if things are going right and you're preg checking at 32 days, an open cow should have a CL there, meaning she came through a heat. Um, maybe we didn't catch that heat, but hopefully she has a CL there and is open. If she doesn't have a CL, she mean, so it means she's not either not cycling or maybe she just had a long cycle, lost that pregnancy a little later, um, or cystic. What we do is kind of a, I call it a G7G, but we'll give them a, a GNRH, a Cisterellin at that time. And then since we're out here every week, we'll recheck that cow next week to see if there's a CL. And if she has a CL, then, then we'll enroll her in the OPSYNC fertility program. Um, once in a while, you'll have like a dead pregnancy or some early embryonic death, or you'll find metritis, which we don't really see a lot of that here. Um, but if we do, we'll give them a prostaglandin and we'll recheck those cows in two weeks. And often they're cleaned up then and have a CL and they're good to enroll in OPSEC again. Um, Brian has been fairly aggressive over the years. Uh, if a cow doesn't get bred, uh, it's at 100 days in milk, uh, they're put on do not breed list. And I can remember uh, years ago, that used to be 200, but I think that's slowly been creeping down, hasn't it, Brian? Yeah. So um, so this is, I just wanted to show you, uh, our cows being confirmed and reconfirmed pregnant by the days carried calf, according to our plan. And you can see this big spike is at 32 days, and those are a lot of the sink cows. Um, we do start maybe a little earlier. There's some probably down to 28, but most are in that 30 to 34 days at that first check. And uh, a 40 day spike here is probably just once in a while I'll say, hey, I'm just not 100% sure if this cow's pregnant at 30 or 32 days. Let's re just recheck her the next week. Um, and then you can see here, here's our recheck, pretty strong right around 60 days as well. So just I think going back again to the compliance, I mean, we make sure and get those cows. Uh, bread. Our open animals being re-inseminated in a timely manner. This is kind of a of our heat detection. Um, you can see a lot of the cows are getting rebred uh, at 20 to 25 days. So those cows are being caught in heat a lot of them if they don't get settled. There is a spike here at 42 days. Those are cows that probably were open at herd check and then enrolled on an off-sync program. Um, this other spike at 50 days is cows that uh, prior in the G7G, and this spike at 56 is cows that are uh, were looted and then uh, enrolled in offset in two weeks. So here we have our last polling question. So here's your last chance to vote for you uh, voters out there. What is your primary method of heat detection? I think I messed that up in the last one a little bit. Anyway, we have uh, four choices here. Uh, the first one is to watch cows for heat. If that's your primary method, you should check that box or that circle. Uh, activity monitors would be your second choice. The third one would be tail painting and chalking. And then the fourth one is no heat detection. It is all bred on, on synchronization. So we are off and running. And again, Abby, do you know what's happening out there in at the uh, Guernsey Jersey herd out at Hordes Dairyman? Yes, the last couple of years, especially, we've been using activity monitoring. And that has really helped improve the reproduction rates um, for both our jerseys, which, uh, you know, jerseys are really good at repro anyway, and then the Guernseys, who aren't necessarily known to be as rep reproductively efficient, but um, we've had a lot of luck using activity and um, breeding cows off of that. We've been able to cut back on our um, synchronization protocols a lot. So I wonder if other people in the audience are finding that as well, but I bet we'll have a nice mix of responses from the ladies and gentlemen in the audience. Mike's closing the poll here. 
Yep, we're going to close the poll. We got 60% of the vote in again. Pretty sacred on that. And again, uh, uh, Brian and Dr. Jones, uh, any comments on uh, on methods of heat detection and where do you fit in here? Um, I'm kind of shocked by it a little bit um, to see the top one just watching for cows in heat. Um, I'd, I'd be curious to what, if you took this poll question 10 years ago and 10 years from now, what it looks like. I think you'll see more activity monitoring and a lot less of uh, no detection, no heat detection and all synchronized breeding. I think you'll see less of that. Um, we fit in with uh, the tail paint or chalk breeding as well is where we would fit in on that category. So on our breeding program, this is our technician here, Tim. Um, cows are walked uh, daily in the mornings uh, by a Gen X technician. Um, they're locked up and walked each time or each each pen at a time. Try not to have the lock turn for any longer than 45 minutes total. Um, I think that's a huge key. Uh, I, I don't like to leave the cows locked any longer than they have to be. Um, so the cows we use Gen X's reveal paint. We use two paints. Uh, the green is for cows open or who have been bred and cows that have been bred we always put up uh, the date they are bred on them and then red is confirmed pregnant cows and then if they do not breed we put a hash mark on the on the tail pins it just just a visual so you see so you can see it if somebody's mess, messing around or bowling that you don't have to mess with them and then the heifers, we use the estrus alert patches on them. 100% um, of the breeding right now is done by Gen X. I've done a little bit here lately, just kind of experimenting. I'm not really comfortable doing it. Um, this is us doing preg check. I'm painting a pregnant cow here, BJ Sleevin. Um, uh, our breeding strategy uh, right now we're shooting for about we need 25 heifers a month to maintain herd size um, we we were making 35 plus a month until we've gone to beef semen because we did have a pretty good source of buyers when the markets were good for excess heifers. But that that's pretty much dried up with markets where they are. Um, two year old, the two year olds are bred uh, two services with sex or no, uh, Two-year-olds are bred sex semen on the first service, but uh, we had been doing that, but recently discontinued it. Just we were seeing some stuff we didn't like on it, and it was all based off of their genomic number, those first uh, first lactation animals. Um, the ba, where are we at? In your bottom 30% of the cows, um, you're using them for the beef semen, right? Yeah, for beef semen, and it was based off of uh, their net merit and energy corrected milk. The top 70% are getting conventional semen now. So basically, you're not using any more sex semen in the, the and, cow herd right now, but right. you were until recently. Yeah. The bull selection, they're all mated by Gen X. Um, we use the top 95% based off of net merit. Historically, we'd uh, put a lot of emphasis on DPR, um, daughter pregnancy rate. We've changed that to put more on emphasis on the components and milk. 
And um, we're also with the genomic testing, we're going to start putting some more emphasis on the wellness traits also. The heifer breeding, they're all, heifers are also walked daily, same time of the day uh, by Gen X, uh, used estrus alerts or estrus patches on them. Um, and then when they're pregnant or confirmed pregnant, we use the red tail paint on it on them so they're easy to identify. And they are all bred off uh, natural heats to heifers. And, and on herd checks, if we find an open one, an open heifer, we'll, we'll administer luda lice and that will usually bring them into heat. Um, heifers that aren't, heifers that don't, don't have CL at that time, we usually move them to DNB because if they're not cycling as a heifer, usually you're going to have a lot more issues. We've seen in our herd, if they're not cycling as a heifer, they're going to have a lot more issues as a calve in later in, in other lactation. So we, if they're not cycling, we move them to do not breed list. And they are also bred with two services of sex semen. And uh, third service is conventional. And after that third service, if they're open, they're put on do not breed list. Guys, yeah, so I think one thing, Brian, you're doing, I mean, you're a lot more aggressive on those heifers making them do not breed. If they're not bred by three services, um, they're out of there or you know, if we don't think they're cycling, you know, we're not doing anything extraordinary. We're not doing cedars or GNRH really trying to get them pregnant. Um, basically, you know, we want, if, I think you're really aggressive at calling out poor doers and, and stuff like that as well. So um, this is just uh, how, you know, how are we doing the first insemination with our voluntary waiting period um, line at 395 days is this blue line. And you can see, we're just relying on natural heat detection a lot. So we don't see those concentrated uh, synchronized groups like we did with the fertility program in the cows. Um, but I think the breeder, you know, we're doing a really good job with those AstroTech patches uh, and locking them once a day. You can see if the animals are being re-inseminated, uh, you know, in 21 days, you know, they, they're getting the majority of the, the breedings. The, the heifers show really good heat. Um, they're outside on dirt a lot. Um, you know, it's just been working really well for them. And we haven't felt the need to get more aggressive there. I know you, we could get a higher pregnancy rate if we wanted, um, but it just seems like it's working us and it's not costing us a lot of extra money or input into it. Um, just so there's, if you have, aren't familiar with AstroTech patches, there's one um, they run, I think, oh, I'm gonna, screw that up, but they're probably around a buck a piece. And they're like scratch off tickets at the lottery, if you have lotteries in your state or country. But when this gray material gets scratched off, it'll, they'll be bright orange from the cow or the heifers in heat. And this is one they just recently bred and they put the, the breeding date on and put a little yellow uh, brick on there. So heat abatement. That's uh, one of the changes we've made over the years. Um, I think that's a big change that we've made. Uh, we used they used to only the fans used to only be placed over the middle rows of the barns, but we've moved them to all rows, and um, we've messed around with the temperatures that they're turning on at. So we have them; they turn on at 68 degrees, and then we've also added uh, soakers to the to the headlock alleyways. And then in the holding area, we've really ramped up the fan power in there and the soakers in there to keep them cool while they're waiting to be milked. And, and I'd say in our area, Brian, uh, the Schilling Farm, I mean, their fans come on before anyone else's, it seems like, you know, I don't think you can overdo the cooling. Just a picture of the, the cows laying in the stalls and the fan placement we 
we placed them off uh, the, uh, we did a wind study in the barn i can't remember who did it but we were shooting for a certain uh, wind speed throughout the barn so we had to change the placement of the fans and it it's really comfortable in there during the summer months also heat abatement i think is huge on the our dry cow facility um we've added more fans and also where our half or our dry cows are fed outside in a lot and we've placed uh, a shade cloth overhead of them that we put up in early may this was taken in the winter so you don't see it but this is where the shade cloth goes for them and that's how that's how keep the cows eating and stay cooler yeah. another thing we strategize for is feed quality um, we really worked hard at that to get it where we need it to be uh, we always check in moistures on our feed we feed out all out of bags we feel that's what's worked really well for us and 2014 we put in feed watch um, that has been a huge success um, it's helped with consistency day in day out um, that way we can monitor feed intakes and also weigh the feed way backs on refusals and then um, cow comfort is a huge um, player in this too. Um, in our newest barn, we did wider and wider and deeper stalls for lawn space. And I think one of the key things is the location of the brisket board in ours. Um, you'll never you'll never see it in ours. Um, we always try to keep the sand full in the stalls, and also in that barn, the alleyways are also wider for better traffic flow through and try to stock like not try to overcrowd too much um, 100 percent stocking density to the number of the stalls we don't like to go over that number occasionally we have to um just just a picture of one of the groups of cows you can see them laying comfortable on the sand stalls this was probably taken in the middle of the week i think because we add sand two times a week um, stalls are groomed daily in between milkings that way they keep the cow comfort so i think another key too is um when we got in this genomic testing in 2011 um we one of the reasons we did was to call about 15 percent of our heifer calves on uh, net merit and we used to sell them as uh, embryo recips um, but that's kind of dried up as brian mentioned um, recently he's going more to the dairy wellness profit uh, that zoetis is marketing uh, just to try and get a total complete uh, healthy animal um, but one thing we noticed when we started doing the genomics is that our DPR was a lot higher than the, the industry average. Um, and some of that is because when Gen X, we started with Gen X, um, they were really pushing that, uh, both the high sire conception rates, the SCR, and the DPR and fertility. And, and back in the day, you know, when did you start with Gen X, Brian? Two. 2000 or 2001 I think you know and before that you weren't really eyeing much I mean Not it was uh, it was more bull bread and, and things there was some rough rocky early years which we didn't really talk about but um, but they they really focused on repro even back then and I think now with the advent of genomics that's really improved uh, now you're focusing more on components and, and milk as well um, but just to give you an example of our last group of calves that you've got the genomic values back on, we were averaging 724. I think this was 70 calves you showed me. Mm -hmm. uh, 724 dairy wellness profit dollars, 621 net merit. And it, they're a 2.0 on DPR even yet. And we were at a 2.0 even when we started doing those genomic tests in, in 2012. 
And they tell me that Jersey fertility is around a 1.5 DPR. So we're, you know, the genetics are there for this herd to be fertile as well. Um, the breed average DPR right now is about 0.8 in 2011 and 12. I mean, it was, I think, more like 0.2. Um, but I think this consistent use of high genetic bulls, both for net merit and DPRs, you know, help you maintain and improve fertility throughout the years. Also, uh, we get together quarterly meetings with everybody on the team that consist of our business consultant, our banker, our two nutritionists, the owners of the feed company, BJ, the vet, and annually we have our breeder there, but I think we're going to start doing having him come more often. And then annually we also have our crop consultant there for um, mostly towards this or, or our first quarter meetings each year. We have him there for crop inputs so we know where what we need crop wise for the cattle and that we re at the meetings we like to review um the production any financial things um go over a lot of dairy comp data and feed inventories kind of address any challenges that we might be seeing or going on in the industry and we always try to set goals for the next quarter and try to hold the, ourselves accountable for our goals. But I think the big thing is when you set a goal, you need to make sure it's you're able to be successful with that goal. Set, set achievable goal. Yeah, set an achievable saying. goal, not not one that's a long shot. Um and then also with our employees that we have, we try to do a monthly meeting that way we can get them involved. I think that's helped a lot with them. Um, we couldn't do it without any of these people at our quarterly meetings and our employees that I'm thankful for every one of them. This is, this is some of, some of the team. Um, uh, from our quarterly meetings. Um, with a summary up, I would say compliance and consistency is a huge part of our success um, uh, with doing weekly preg checks, also giving the right shot at the right time. Nutrition also plays a huge huge role in this with forage quality and consistency also going along with that and heat cow comfort and heat abatement is a huge player in this too um, and things always change are always changing so if that ever needs to be addressed and fresh fresh cow is a huge is a huge player in this too getting those cows off to a healthy start to follow through with the whole lactation get them bred back and keep keep the cycle going also with bull selection and genomics have played a huge role in this with our fertility program so that being said we just also want to throw a plug in for the dairy cattle reproduction council if you haven't heard of it they um have a nice website they've got some uh, uh brian's a member of it and he's gone to some of the meetings as well and, and, and part of the awards program too but they've got a nice website dcrccouncil.org um I, I encourage you guys to check it out um but they've really been trying to improve reproduction in, in the industry and uh, have a lot of good meetings every year i think it's in uh I forget where it's at this year, but <laughs> Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. So uh, there's just our contact info uh, for Brian and myself. Uh, if you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to email us. program back to you we want to thank both uh, uh, Dr. Jones and Brian for an excellent presentation here and we start uh, getting uh, some summary stuff before we do the Q&A. Very good, thank you, Mike. Yes, thank you to Brian and Dr. Jones for taking time out of your busy schedules 
to create this presentation and be with us today. It's always good to hear what other people are doing on their farms, especially um, a dairy like yours that has reached a high level of success in the area of reproduction. So thank you. Um, also a reminder that our webinars are always archived. So if you want to listen to this webinar again or share it with someone else, feel free to visit our website, hordes.com slash webinars, and take a look at those presentations there. Um, want to give a point you to the screen here. Our next webinar will take place on April 8th, um, which is the second Monday in April. And our topic that week will be milking evaluation reveals costly problems. Um, this is a study that was done by Filder, Stan Moore, and others at Michigan State University Extension, looking at both milking equipment and some mil milking protocols and um, revealing some of the problems that might be costing dairy. So please mark your calendars for April 8th and join us for our next webinar. We'd love to have you on board. Mike, I know we have some questions that came in beforehand and there are some other ones that came in. And um, once again, if you guys in the audience look at that GoToWebinar panel, you can type questions in and we've got a lot there. So we'll have Mike go through those and Brian and BJ will get a chance to answer some of them. Okay, well, we have a couple that came in quite early, and so uh, we have one uh, from uh, Georgia, and that is, what is your criteria for leaving a cow not to breed? Is it days in milk or set of service uh, numbers of services, uh, past production and, and genetic cutoff? What are you using there, uh, Brian? Um, 180 days in milk <laughs> is where we label them as a do not breed cow if they're in site or if they've been serviced in that we won't breed them also um as they get older if they're showing any kind of lameness or just not in production as well we'll label them as a do not breed and then milk them until they fall below a certain level okay um um, uh, Dr. Jones, this may be one for you as well. What is the ideal heat detection rate to aim for under ideal circumstances? This is one of our colleagues in Pakistan. Right, and I, I think, you know, that can be pretty variable. You know, certainly we've shown here that you can hit, you know, over a 70% heat detection rate with a combination of fertility program um, and heat detection. I think in most of my herds, we strive for 60% in our area. Um, you know, it's kind of what our goal is. 60%. Okay, here we have some other ones. Uh, are you doing any double breeding of cows, like in the morning and the PM uh, as well, in your breeding program, Brian? No, they're all one service. Is what we've Dr. Been doing. Okay, Dr. Jones, would you agree? Do you have other herds that are doing the double breeding or just go with the one breeding uh, as well? Yeah. I'd say once in a while, um, if there's a problem breeder or maybe she's showing a long heat, um, that guys will do a second breeding, but we don't do a lot of that. Okay, here's another question for you, Brian. Have you seen any correlation relationships between lameness and reproduction in your herd there? And again, uh, uh, Dr. Jones, you may want to comment with your other clients as well. Um, yeah, there's a correlation there. Lame the cows that if you have any lame cows typically aren't cycling um usually their bottom body condition might be a little under than what it ideally is compared to the rest of the herd if there's any lameness um so they're generally not cycling and we might not breed them possibly yeah i think lameness can be a huge issue and brian i don't we didn't really talk about it but you have the hoof trimmer there what every week yeah and you're running uh, foot baths, uh, how often? Three days a week we're running. And when are you trimming, hoof trimming the cows? Because I, I, I don't see lame cows at your farm. Uh, or maybe they're hiding, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we trim feed at uh, 80 days in milk. Um, I had to switch that around because I actually, I was seeing some early embryonic death due to the handling a little bit. I mean, it was real minute. But so I s try to have them trimmed a week before their first service. Here's a related question. It says, do you see much difference with mun values on cows in terms of drops in fertility? Any relationship you're trying to tie with muns? And Brian, maybe do you know where your mun numbers are in the herd? Our herd mun averages 10.2. 
I guess I've never really looked at the correlation. I mean, most of the nutritionists we work with around here, I mean, we're trying to keep it in that 10 to 12 range. And I think closer to the 10 nowadays, um, do it, just keep our feed costs low and try and less, use less protein. But, uh, I mean, certainly if you get high months, I mean, it can impact fertility. I mean, we had a case several years ago now, with just on a, a grazing herd that was doing some really rich alfalfa and was having some mon issues and some fertility problems, but I can't remember what levels those were. Okay, here's another one from a foreign country. Uh, what do you recommend in situations in which the diet might be low in starch, like 15 or 20 percent, to induce follicle growth? Uh, relationships there. Uh, thoughts on that, uh, Dr. Jones? I might like let you take that one, Mike. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, we certainly know when we're low on energy. Um, that's when we see cows that aren't cycling soon after calving and, and have problems and goes with a low body condition or a lot of body condition loss. I guess I don't know exactly what percent starch to recommend there. but Yeah, we probably are looking somewhere in that 25 to 26 to 27 right now. Corn, even though it's a little gone up in price recently, still is a good buy compared to our computer software programs as far as that goes. Uh, here's another question that comes in on preg rate. Uh, how, how is it calculated? Um, may want to comment on that, Dr. Jones. So, you know, preg rate is a, is a computer number. And basically what it is, is your heat detection rate times your conception rate. Um, Cause it's actually what percent of cows do you get pregnant in a, in a 21 day heat interval um, is what preg rate stands for. Um, and we need fancy computers for us to figure it out. Um, but usually it starts when your voluntary waiting period starts. So if you're using, we use dairy comp a lot. If you use dairy comp, the default I think is 53 days you actually got to adjust your voluntary waiting period in, in dairy comp to do that for you. So for, for Brian, when he calculates his preg rate, it's set more at 80 days is what 86. 86. When most of the cows are getting bred or when your voluntary waiting period is. So if, if you're extending your voluntary waiting period, you want to adjust that, but it's what percent of cows get pregnant in a 21 day heat interval. Um, and so it looks our, like, yeah, and your herd, yeah. what does it look like about 31, 32%? We're actually around close to 40% on the preg rate, mm -hmm. which wow. is really, I mean, we're, most herds, if we're over 30, we're really happy um, with a 30% preg rate. Um, but with it, we just have such good heat detection rate and conception rate here that we're really doing good on the uh, preg rate. Okay. Do you use uh, PGF2 alpha at 10 days in milk to clean up the uteruses? Yes. Hmm. Every cow? On every cow. Every cow. Doc, any comments on that? You know, we, we, uh, a lot of our herds are on what's called the pre sync off sync, where they're given two shots of prostaglandin before they even do that. And, you know, we feel it, that helps clean them up as well. And, uh, we'd have no problem using that. I, I guess, you know, just from a judicious use, uh, we like to use it on just cows you think maybe would need it that early, you know, if they didn't clean or had twins or something like that is kind of what we would recommend. Okay. I think we know the answer, Brian, but you may want to re repeat it here. Have you pushed stocking densities higher in the past? And do you feel that your current stocking density impacts your reproductive successes? Um. We have pushed it a little higher um, when before we had added another barn or added onto the last barn when we did that. Uh, I think we were probably about 25% overcrowded. Um, I think in a couple of the groups it was, um, it definitely did affect the reproduction um but also the timing of the year it was more towards uh late fall when that was going on so i think timing of the year plays a big role in when you're where your stocking is too okay so you're saying you don't want to really stock heavy in the summer if you yeah. can avoid it yeah if you were going to overstock i'd overstock in winter months uh, do you think 180 days is too early for do not breed for high producing cows? Mm, sometimes I wonder that, but 
we don't have a lot of cows that get there. Okay. Uh, another quick question. Uh, are you using any of the repro uh, reproductive friendly fats such as Megalac R or flaxseed or some of those uh, PUFA products in the herd? What about your status on fat feeding for reproduction? Nothing, right? What fat are you using? <laughs> I, I know there's some, but I'd have to have a I can't think of what it is. I don't think there's any specific though that are geared towards yeah that are uh, geared towards the reproduction, so to so to say. Okay, very good. Uh, what was the reasoning for using a higher dose rate for GnRH? Um, one, I, Paul Fricky was doing a study. I think it was on it. He went away from it, but we've just kept doing it, and we've seen some pretty good success with it, and so we kind of kept with it. Yeah, I don't think there's any research out there that says you should do that, but uh, other than Brian Schilling's on-farm research that he likes it. <laughs> yep. So. Understood. Um, if there is a reproductive fresh check uh, conducted, which which I think you are doing, if so, how do you address problems? Uh, if you discover something in the, in the in the fresh check, are you arming those cows every day in those first uh, twenty days? What uh, the first twenty days? Not every day. We're not arming them. But, um, they're. Uh, we're not doing any vet checks with them. Yeah, Brian's no. just, uh, you know, if he sees problems behind the yeah, cow. Yeah, I'll address them. I don't like to uh, reach in a cow unless there's an issue. And, and we don't do any routine fresh checks. Um, seems like with the prostaglandin Brian's used, we don't see hardly any metritis by the time they get to breeding. So there's no reproductive ultrasound uh, prior to that first service. Okay, uh, here we go again. What What is your uh, abortion rate in the herd? Do you have a rough feel for what that number might be? Um, you know, we haven't looked that up recently. I mean, basically when you're checking, maybe Brian knows. I think it's less than 4%. You know, and I think that includes your early embryonic yeah. death rate because we're checking them at 30 days. And we in the past, we normally expect, uh, if you're checking them at 30 days and 60, we expect no more than 10% pregnancy loss there. So if we're at 4% overall, that's really good. It, I know it's really low. Wow, that is, that's impressive. That is really impressive as far as that goes. In your opinion, uh, what, uh, uh, what herd percentage subclinical and clinical ketosis is abnormal and does it impact uh, conception and preg rates in the herd? So I think we're looking at that, that uh, the, the, you're doing the ketosis monitoring at day four and 11. Uh, there's less than 5% that has it, the test for it. And you're using it at one point? A one, I, well, I'm anything under 1.4 or anything above 1.4, I'll treat. And you're seeing what percent you said? Less than Less than 10%. You know, and I think in the studies, they say if you're running over 15% subclinical ketosis is when you're going to start seeing problems yep. with fertility or other cow issues. And very, and Brian, you mentioned you treat. Are, are you, are you uh, uh, basically giving propylene glycol? What, are you, what is your treatment of those cows that are showing positive ketosis test over 1.4, for example? So anything over a 1.4, they'll get a dose of propylene glycol and a, with um, vitamin B12. And then if it's over a 2.4, which is not a whole lot, we'll, we'll pump them, pump their stomachs with the alfalfa meal and some um, vitamins and um, electrolyte mix. And then... Okay. If it if it's over a three, will IV, which is not a whole lot of them, hardly ever, but occasionally we'll have one. And and we and I like to visually see a meeting too, when I before. Wait. I 
when you drench your propylene glycol, do you follow up the next day again, or is it just a one shot affair? Uh, no, it, it, three day, three days, and then I'll recheck. And what are you? And what are you yeah. pumping about uh, 200, 300 milliliters? How much propylene glycol are you are you drenching when when you're giving 300 it? Three hundred milliliters. Okay, very good. What kind of record keeping systems are you used to keep track of all those shots and when they're needed? Dairy comp, dairy comp, it's all recorded in. Okay, and then you print that off, and then away you go as far as that goes. Yep, yep. So again, what are the possible reasons to give Bovashield that twenty-one days in milk post calving? Uh, I, I like it because we're not doing the whole herd at one time, and it's small groups. That's just kind of how I've done it. I don't know. What do you think, BJ? Well, we like the modified live uh, vaccines, which Bovashield is one. Um, and we think if we do it uh, pre-breeding, we usually want to do it at least 30 days before breeding. Um, I think probably we're doing a little bit earlier than most guys. Most guys are probably doing it around a month now. Um, you don't want to do it too close to calving because their their normal steroid levels are high. Um, but Brian's cows are so healthy usually, and there's not a lot of, of problems um, doing it that three weeks. Uh, you know, gives us at least a month before we're going to breed them again, uh, 80 days, so uh, more than a month, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but okay. we just think if you want to use a live vaccine before breeding, that I mean, that's when the cow needs that protection against all those uh, repro viruses and diseases. Um, we've really been happy with it, and we don't use any – uh, more modified live and pregnant cows or anything like that. We just kind of aim for the pre-fresh to, to get that protection in. Brian, what is the culling rate in the herd typically right now? 35 or 8%, I think it is right now. Okay. Okay. Is uh, the, the G6G, is it a good option for fresh cows for the first breeding um, in, in the pro, in, on the farm? I don't think so you're using it, but I think it's... We've only good. used it for a problem, uh, cows without CLs and the resink, and it's worked really good for us. Um, we actually don't keep track on dairy comp, I don't think. Yeah. Oh, you do? Mm -hmm. What? And then you're seeing a pretty good response from it? Yeah. You know, it used to be we didn't see many of those cows here, but lately, last few years, we've seen a few of them. Um, I, I think if you were using it in as your first breeding, I think it would work really well, to be honest. We don't have any herds using it that way, um, but it's it seems like it's worked really well just on cows we've used it on. Uh, how much uh, fertility checks are you performing uh, before uh, the voluntary waiting period? And at what days in milk might you be doing those if you're doing that, if you have problematic cows? Um, we don't do any here. Um, in some herds where um, more of my organic herds, and I do have some guys that like to do pre-fresh checks, usually we're doing them around uh, three weeks, three to four weeks post-fresh. If if I if I have an issue with a cow, I'll have BJ sleeve her or check her. But typically, we don't have many cows with that any issues like that. But you okay. hold on here and there. You are gaining, guys. There aren't too many left. Uh, hang on. Uh, what is the, your typical body condition score at dry off and calving and at first breeding? In other words, do do are cows losing weight? And if so, where, where are we at on body condition score in the herd? Um, I mean, historically, I think if you walked in this herd, you might think it's a little fat. Uh, you know, they, they have really good body condition all the way through. I think Brian's looking up maybe his last, uh, his last data where the averages are and stuff like that. Um, you pull that up, but I mean, the, the cows themselves, I mean, compared to some other dairies I have are probably a little bit more moderate framed. And I think that's some of from bring for net merit. Um, they're really good commercial cows, good uttered, uh, moderate framed. They do, you know, tend to keep a fair amount of body condition. So you're not seeing much loss, I guess. I'm, I'm reading between the lines here. Uh, no, Dr. He really doesn't for these dry offs. So, you know, around 3.5 to 3.7 three seven. Um, type thing. And we don't see a lot of body condition loss, to be honest. I mean, they, those cows don't get that skinny. 
Yeah, and I think that's a real bingo. I think uh, we're seeing more and more of that coming. If you look at the research from Fricky and groups, there's that those cows that don't lose much body weight really are pretty fertile cows as far as that goes out there in the program. Here's, I think, our last question. Do you think uh, an environment with challenges with heat stress, you need to go to a shorter breeding season window and a lower voluntary waiting period? Uh, uh, perhaps, Dr. Jones, that's kind of your call uh, in terms of, we, we know, Brian, you've got a great situation out there and it's working really well as far as that goes uh can you repeat the question yeah what about heat stress uh, uh in other words if you got some challenge with heat stress uh would you be looking at going to a shorter voluntary waiting period than say the 90 or 100 days as far as that goes to get semen into the cow maybe quicker uh i think it's one of our international questions that came in okay. here i mean i think if you came i mean we've really done well you know with the extending voluntary waiting period out but I think if you know, say you're coming, be coming into a hotter season, yeah, I might move that down to 60 days personally. Um, I, I don't really like breeding a cow before 60 days myself. And the dairy herds, I don't see like they settle as good. Um, so, you know, if you you know you're coming in the hot season, I might uh, try and get more of those cows pregnant before the high heat hit. Well, Brian, you got some nutritionists on board here, so get ready. Here we go. They would, they're they they're asking you, do you feed Romenzen? And then the question, uh, what kind of levels of protein and energy are you sh uh, shooting for to try to enhance uh, or maintain the great fertility you have here in the herd? Uh, we do feed Romenzen. The pro, and what'd you say? You're looking for like the protein? Yeah, do you have a feel on the protein status in the herd? You're feeding lots of, it looks like you're feeding lots of haylage at this point uh, as far as the base diet goes. Ah, uh, we actually have a pretty high, well, I'm trying to pull up my ration here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what percent pro? I think we're shooting for right around 16. Okay, sounds very good. And already you told us you're not feeding, you are feeding some fat, but we're not sure they are um, the re reproductive enhancing fats and the, the PUFAs as far as that goes. It could no, be. No, we're not, we're, not, we're not feeding any of that, them at all. I, we were at one time, but obviously with these great prices that we have right now, we've we've skimmed back on a lot of those foo foo products and seen what what was working and what wasn't working, and some we've added back in, some we've taken out and kept out. But okay, here's cows. What percent like corn silage and haylage are you feeding? Do you think the corn silage is? Uh, he's looking i can see that right now well i can hear that right now as well he's looking. The, the, so the protein is a 16 percent protein okay. rack. very um, good and that's 77 tdn tdn is what it's set at okay very good well, listen, Abby, I think we're ready to wrap this up. If uh, you're ready to wrap up uh, uh, the formal ends of this webinar, we've got lots of questions, guys. Thanks for hanging with us. Lots of tough questions as far as that goes. Okay. Yes, definitely. Um, we have a great audience on today, and thank you all for listening and for the questions that you brought in. Um, Brian and Dr. Jones, great job getting through those questions in uh, kind of the speed round there. Um, lots of topics were covered. Do you want to play you all to next month's webinar, April 8th, 2019, Milking Evaluation Reveals Costly Problems. That will be presented by another dynamic duo of speakers, Phil Durst and Stan Moore from Michigan State University, and they're with the extension there. So please make plans to attend. Um, again, thank you all for being part of our audience today to listen to Brian and Dr. Jones, and um, we look forward to having you join us for future webinars. Until next time, I'd like to say farewell from all of us here at the Horde Steerman office in Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin, and our partners at the University of Illinois. We hope to have you join us for a future webinar.